If you told me the result of the Mistral AI hackathon that happened in SF this past weekend would be a new, if not kind of dusty release of Mistral 7B version 0.2 base, and a bot actually playing Doom with Mistral 7B, I probably wouldn't have believed you, but this hackathon was a crazy collaboration of a bunch of really smart people in SF. I wish I could have been there, and I want to talk about a few of these projects. So what are these projects? What have they pushed forward? Have we seen actually some advancements in fine tunes of Mistral 7B? version 0.2 base as a result of this? And was there anything that resulted from this hackathon that you can actually use to enable your own workflows or even edit videos on YouTube? Welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So this hackathon was pretty cool, and I will say the few projects that gained a ton of attention on Twitter were obviously the most exciting. Just because they're exciting doesn't mean there weren't other projects that maybe weren't as visual that are just as impactful. So the first I want to go over is Mistral 7B playing Doom, which is incredibly cool. So what this team did was they trained Mistral 7B playing Doom on ASCII representations and as a result, now it can actually just play Doom. And this is really clever because in terms of creating bots that play games, the hardest part is how you represent the game environment to the LLM and then ask it what to do. And in this case, they rendered the entire thing in ASCII, which is actually something that for those of you who don't know, um, the VLC command line app can do. You can actually render any video in completely ASCII. And yeah, as a result, they have this incredibly cool tool that can now effectively play Doom as Mistral 7B. We've seen Minecraft bots that use GPT-4 to do this, but it's really cool to see a much smaller open source LLM clearly still capable of running the game. And frankly, as a software engineer, seeing this mapping of ASCII instructions to the actual game in 3D is incredibly cool. And I'll be linking to um, more information about this in the description below. Another really cool project came from participants from Flyflow, which is basically an LLM's API with lower latency. So they wanted to figure out if streamlining LLM prompting with AI-driven prompting itself could be used to actually define behavior through tests and then as a result, optimize the prompts for your chosen model, saving you time and effort in the process. So I thought this was pretty cool because a lot of times when we look at prompt optimization, it's just kind of different language to use or it's understanding a different sort of template of conversation to interact with an LLM. And what's cool here is if you're a software engineer, I mean, you understand that when you're writing tests, you're basically writing what the perfect execution of a model would be or what the perfect execution of your software is. And as a result, you know, if you can enforce and get your software to abide by those rules, in theory, the output is clear. And it's kind of an interesting, and it's a cool way to think backwards about improving prompts and LLMs. What's interesting here is they say that one of the main challenges they encountered when ensuring that generated prompts were tailored to the specific requirements is that each model obviously has its own quirks and practices for prompting, which took a lot of research. And it looks like the biggest thing they solved here or solved against was developing a robust, semantically similar algorithm that could accurately evaluate the performance of the generated prompts against the desired output. And frankly, this is something that Jan Peleg has employed in sort of his brute forcing approach when fine tuning 7 billion parameter LLMs that have reached the top of the LLM leaderboard. So. I thought that was pretty cool. And going forward, they wanna to try to support even more LLMs and explore potential for applying their approach to other areas of AI entirely, such as fine tuning models for specific tasks or domains. And I think this fits really well within the theme of AI agents that Mistral AI was trying to foster at this event. We also got to see some other projects that focused on using a Mistral powered agent for improving uh, search engines for ML research. Mistral playing Pac-Man, which was also pretty cool. And then some other sort of sales and social media aimed projects, some in media, some just aimed at creating better leads, which was kind of cool. Obviously those are less exciting and they're far less visual, but I think they still demonstrate some really cool things you can do with Mistral and that you don't actually have to just hammer a GPT-4 API to do. Now, one of the coolest things that was sort of a side effect of all this development over the weekend was we got to see one of the first public DPO fine tunes of Mistral 7B version 0.2 base. I'm curious if this is still good. DPO does a lot of amazing things with Mistral models once it's applied properly. And I'm curious if this model is actually that much better. And Miguel Tessera claims to have done that. So one interesting thing here is he says that it might feel like Cloud Opus, 
given how big the context length is. And frankly, I should have mentioned this in the last video that the biggest advancement of this model, even if it's not that much more performant than the original version of Mistral 7B we got just about a year ago, is its context length is so much longer and that you can just give it more information and it does a much better job of understanding and retaining context while it's thinking about something that's kind of big. So let's look at the Hugging Face page and see if there's anything else to know. So curiously, this page has very little information. Tess is short for Tesoro or treasure in Italian, and it's meant to be a general purpose large language model that is basically as capable as Mistral 7B. Obviously this was trained and fine-tuned on top of Mistral 7D version 0.2 base. It uses a relatively simple system prompt format where you're just given, you know, a system user and assistant set of prompts and you're off to the races. They also show some code examples for how to use this model, which I appreciate. I mean, I'm an engineer and software guy, so I don't really need this, but I like when they provide at least a little bit of basis for someone starting to use this. And what's also interesting is they mention where its limitations and biases are. They say, while this model aims for accuracy, it will occasionally produce inaccurate or misleading results. Despite diligent efforts in refining and pre-training data, there remains a possibility for the generation of biased uh, information, basically saying it's not as um, polished as some other LLMs, obviously. And uh, they just say, you know, be careful and cross-check what it gives you because it's a beta model, which I think should go for most anything on Hugging Face. So let's try this out. All right, so I'm here in my Hugging Face endpoint and I'm eager to try this out. So right now I'm going to try just some basic tests. And what I'm calling this test now is kind of the jacket test. So saying it's sunny out, but the temperature is quite cold and seeing what this model recommends. All right, so here we go. So good, it understood the system prompt. We got Guru back, which that's not system or assistant, but that's interesting enough. So it says, if the temperature is below 30 C, you should wear layers of clothing to keep warm. Start with a base layer, moisture wicking fabric, add a middle layer for insulation, such as wool. Okay, good, so it understands you don't wanna to get uh, too much moisture built up. Say for your lower body, warm fitted trousers or jeans, that's fair, telling us to wear layers, and then wearing a hat to keep your head and face warm. It tells us to wear shoes, which I guess is important, and then reiterates that with the right layering, you can stay warm and comfortable even when it's below 30 on a sunny day. So that's pretty cool. Frankly, this is significantly better than what I was getting with just the bare bones base model of Mistral 7B version 0.2 base. So this is encouraging. Let me try a few, not programming questions yet, but just some more complex inputs that just carry with them more tokens. So this question I like to call the Uber test. The prompt here is my electric vehicle won't start, which I've abbreviated as EV. So that's kind of the first test, basically saying for some reason the doors won't open and asking what I should try to fix first before I should just use an Uber instead. And this is left deliberately vague, basically to indicate that I have somewhere to be and that instead of driving my EV, I would just take an Uber. And I found that, you know, when you give complex prompts like this that are still deliberately vague or use abbreviation, sometimes it trips up these models. So I'm curious to see what this fine tune of Mistral Tesoro actually manages to do. All right, so it understands that was the user prompt. We might run out of tokens here, but let's see. So curiously, it came back with a different assistant prompt. So it came back as me, which I guess is supposed to be like an internal thought process. So like me thinking about what I should do to see if this is working. So it tells me to check the door lock, the latch, the hinges, the handle, the sensors. Obviously, I don't think the hinges would have anything to, anything to do with the battery. And it understands what an EV is, so that's interesting. It says, call your local EV dealership, uh, telling me what to tell them. That's kind of interesting. And it, well, it's still okay, it's still going. So be prepared to provide the VIN, that does happen. Telling us not to be mean to them or a, a rude person. And okay, so it actually got it. This is actually how you do this on a Tesla. There is actually a handle you can pull once you um, pull off part of the front bumper and then it says, then it's time to call for help. If that still doesn't work, um, this, this service technician may be able to help you get a temporary fix. So it didn't say to charge up the battery or to like pop the trunk and change the battery, which really was the right answer here. But it does understand I'm talking about an EV being an electric vehicle. 
and it says they're complex. Issues like this can happen from time to time because of software or sensor failures, and it's always best to have a trained technician fix those so you don't hurt yourself. So this is interesting. It gave us a lot of good dialogue, and it is much more capable in terms of being conversational than Mistral 7B has been in the past. So I'm curious to see what was actually used to fine tune this. However, even with its larger context window, it still struggled to understand that the problem here was that the secondary battery failed and that in an electric car, you know, charging the battery or checking the charge of the battery might be something you would check. And in this case, that wasn't mentioned. Also, one of the most important things to check when you're doing anything with an EV that you're fixing is to disconnect the contactors, which makes sure that you're not putting your hands around anything that may be uh, involuntarily energized with high voltage. So it got close. This is still very impressive and more impressive than just the bare bones base model but let's move on to a few coding questions. So I'm using some questions that are a bit more exotic. Today, what I wanna ask is if this model can write a function in Lua, so kind of an exotic language, that will allow me to see if an LLM prompt abides by predefined system prompt. So again, I'm being deliberately vague and not actually giving it a system prompt, but the idea here is I'm showing that the function should take a predefined system prompt format along with a raw prompt, and then tell me if that is actually abiding by it, and then if it's not, then try to do its best to fix it. So this isn't really something that can necessarily be achieved, but I wanna see how the model reacts. So let's see what it gives us. So it does give us a relatively complex function here. Lua is interesting because it has some very different ways of manipulating strings, which is kind of cool. And now it's explaining what this does. So it's saying it checks the provided prompt if it matches the format against a few different variables which is kind of cool. So it's looking for predominantly S and U. Basically I said it always has to have a system and user uh, component. So the example usage demonstrates how to use the check prompt format function. Okay, so pretty good. At least it understands that potential outputs are success and fail, and then it understands what it can actually improve in a limited way. Now for my final question here, I'm just going to ask it again to generate a Mandelbrot set and we'll see if it can do that in Python. And the twist here is I want to have a Python function that generates the Mandelbrot set and then use JavaScript to actually visualize it, which is a bit of a twist. And here we go. So it understood the input prompt and now we're getting the Python function. Okay, cool. So that looks about right. Mandelbrot set, now it missed a little bit here because it's saying we're visualizing using matplotlib, which I guess technically uses some JavaScript, but we'll have to see. The general function here for the Mandelbrot set appears right, just in its general structure. Now it's showing us how to use matplotlib to visualize, and we'll see if it just totally ignored the last part. And it looks like it did. Okay, so this would be an example of it kind of hallucinating or deliberately ignoring something we told it to do, because it, it's it appears to just be thinking that matplotlib is JavaScript, which is kind of interesting. So a bit of a miss, and I think this is an example of where we have a lot more conversational ability, specifically having to do with the system prompt this uses, which is uh, a user, system, and assistant. And I think sometimes system and assistant get a little bit mixed up with this model. But nonetheless, this is an incredibly impressive model coming off just a weekend of hacking at the SF Hackathon sponsored by Mistral AI. I hope that we see more events like this where we see more kind of novel use cases. Obviously, a lot of what we see from these um, events is not like super directly applicable to business things. Uh, and the ones that you generally see on Twitter are more visual. But then again, having it play Doom and Pac-Man was really cool. And yeah, so I'm curious, have any of you in the meantime been fine tuning on top of Mistral 7B version 0.2 base? Do you think Tess or Tesoro is actually a market improvement from my previous video covering Mistral 7B via Dotto 2 Base? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share, and we'll see you in the next one.